If you have your Bibles, open with me in the book of Judges, chapter 2. What I'm going to share with you, it's a prophetic exhortation and a prophetic reminder why we are so passionate about discipling nations. So uh, I want to share briefly about transforming nations with the gospel. We transform nations with the gospel. If you listen to Dineo very well, you realize that the only solution to the ills of society, it's the gospel. The only solution to the ills of society is the gospel. Let me put it to you this way. It'll help. It takes a transformed heart to transform society. It takes a transformed heart to transform society. You can try everything to change a politician not to be corrupt, but as long as Jesus is not Lord in their hearts, we're going to struggle. They're going to build a bridge where there's no river. I like that. <laughs> Politicians will always find something to just use money inappropriately. Can I ask you this question? How many of you believe that Africa has a lot of potential? How many of you believe Africa has a lot of potential? All right, when people look at Africa and they, they just see, man, dark continent, there is no dark continent. Let me tell you, just before COVID, seven of the fastest growing economies were in Africa. Seven of the fastest growing economies were in Africa because there's so much potential, there's so much development that can still be enhanced in Africa. That is why I say I'm surprised that we don't have Ghanaian chocolate in South Africa. There's so much we can do building bridges between our countries in Africa. The Great Commission is a covenant statement. The Great Commission is a statement to remind us that God has called us to go and make disciples of all nations. Can I hear you say all? All in the Greek means all. There's no other revelations besides that. All means all. Go and make disciples of all nations. So I want to emphasize this point before I bring this prophetic exhortation that if we want to see nations transformed, we need to go and make disciples. We need to preach the gospel to see hearts transformed. I look at the mayor of our city, Johannesburg. She's a woman who submitted under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I mean, she's only been a mayor for a few months. It's not been a year. And you see the change that is happening in the city. She visited our church earlier in the year. And you can see the character of Jesus in her life. And I believe that our city is blessed because the Bible says the city, the nations rejoice when the righteous rule. So we need to pray and trust God for godly presidents, godly premiers, godly uh, prime ministers. So here's the word of exhortation I want us to read from Judges um, chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I saw to give your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall, not, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sight, and their gods shall be a snare to you. Verse 4. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke those words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim, which means crying or weeping. And they sacrificed to the Lord. If we pause there for a little bit to give you context of the scripture, the Israelites, they are on a journey. They have come out of Egypt. They are going to the promised land. And the Bible is very clear that the Lord will drive out the nations that were there so that they can be able to inherit that which God had promised. But God was very clear. God says, I will never break my covenant with you. God says, I will never break my covenant with you. Let me remind you, the Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. 
Whatever he promises, he keeps his promises. God promised that he will be with us when we go and make disciples. He said, I will never, never, never break my covenant. May we stand on this promise of God. As we trust to see nations transformed, may we stand on this promise that God promised that he will never, never break his covenant. God always keeps his part of the bargain. We are the ones who break the side of our bargain. God always keeps the covenant. We are the ones who don't keep our side of the covenant. You see, that's exactly what happened from what we've read. They are the ones who ran away, who moved away from the covenant God had with him. The Bible says, so now I say I will not drive them out, the nations that were still left, but they shall become thorns on your side. May I submit to you, and I'm hoping this will help you to face the challenges that we may be facing in the world. May I submit to you that it could be that the challenges we are facing today It's because we've moved away from the covenant that God has with us. As nations, we've moved away from the covenant that God wants to have with us. Let's continue to read because it will give us more context. Verse 6 says, when Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance. That word is very important, to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at age 110 years. I'm jumping to verse 10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. There arose another generation. After Joshua's generation had died, there arose another generation that did not know the Lord, know the work that he had done for Israel. I want to submit to you over and over again, the reason we have this mandate to transform nations, to disciple nations, is to bring back people to the original covenant, to be in a relationship with the Lord. When we preach the gospel, we're bringing people to the image of God that is right there in Genesis chapter 1. That is why we preach the gospel. The reason we have the problems we have in the world today, we've moved away from covenant. When we preach the gospel, we're just saying, come back to covenant. Could it be that the challenges we are facing today is because we've forgotten the ways of the Lord? We've moved away from the covenant God has for us. And verse 11 states it very clear. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods among the gods of the peoples who were around them, and they bowed down to them and provoked the Lord to anger. Now, I want to drive this point home as we come to a prophetic declaration I have for us. We need to have a revelation that to transform nations, we need to preach the gospel. There is no other way to transform society and nations without the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel is to bring people back to the original design that God has created us to be. That's the preaching of the gospel. How many of you remember the time when you got saved? Do you remember the time you got saved? When I got saved, there was something that happened inside here. I cannot explain, but the joy of the Lord that came upon me, it was bringing me back to covenant, original design. So let's go to verse 18 of Judges 2. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, The Lord was with the judge and saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. Verse 19. But whenever a judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers 
going after other gods, saving them and bowing down to them. So sad. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he said, because this people have transgressed my covenant that I've commanded their fathers, they've moved away from the covenant that I've commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua had left before he died in order to test the Israel by whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations not driving them out quickly and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Chapter 3 verse 1. Now these are the nations that the Lord left. See how these words are repeated. To test Israel. Those nations were left to test Israel by them that is in all Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generations of the people of Israel might know war to teach war to those who had not known it. Verse 4. They were there for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord which had commanded to their fathers. So I want to submit to you this morning. It could be that some of the ills of society that we see today, God has left them so that we can be a generation that will rise up and address those ills of society. We can be a generation that will rise up and say, we will take back people to God's covenant. The Lord left some nations to test the Israelites who had no experience of war. May I remind you that we are at war? If you didn't realize we are at war, there's so much happening in our nations today. There are spirits that are pushing different agendas. I mean, I don't have to mention all those agendas, you know them, whether it's witchcraft, whether it's LGBTQ, whether it is uh, just the spirit of materialism, there is a spirit behind all these things. But as children of God, I believe God may have left those ills to teach us warfare, to teach us to go on our knees, to teach us to be people of the word. Let me bring it close to home. In case you are facing battles in your life, just know that it is training for raining. If you're facing any battle in your life, it is training for raining. If you're facing battles in your marriage, it may be that your marriage is set up to transform the nation and the enemy is threatened. It may be that the enemy is threatened because he sees that there's something significant about your marriage, about your life. Let me tell you a story. My son, when he was uh, 14 months old, he fell into our swimming pool at home. The person who was supposed to be looking after him just neglected him. And he crawled, walked close to the swimming pool, and he was face down, already not breathing. By God's grace, my sister, who happened to be around at the time, ran to the pool, pulled him out, and resuscitated him back to life. My son is alive today because God intervened. We know that the enemy was threatened by the call that is on his life. And I believe that God planned it in such a way that my sister will be there at the time who knew what to do. It's a miracle that our son is alive. Just in case you think that is the end, a few years ago, my son was cycling to school. A car came from behind. A car hit him. And he went up and down. The bicycle went under the car. He came out unscathed, no broken bone. The enemy will try everything because he knows the destiny that is upon our lives. The enemy is threatened by those who are praying. The enemy is threatened by those who are fasting. The enemy is threatened by those who value the word of God. So the declaration I want to give to you today is this. 
if you're facing challenges, if your nation is facing challenges, know that those challenges, those ills may be left so that we can land war, we can be able to experience battles and bring back the nation to God's original covenant. Let me also encourage you with this. God will turn your pain into your purpose. Whatever pain, whatever battle, God will turn your pain into your purpose. God will turn your pain into your mission. Growing up in Pochestrum, South Africa, for those of you who know the history of South Africa, Pochestrum, my hometown, is the birthplace of apartheid, the racial re- segregation that you have heard about, that you've read about in South Africa. That place, my hometown, is the birthplace of racial segregation. When I was growing up, going through school, my parents could not afford to pay for school fees and anything that was needed for school. So I needed to work on Saturdays as a gardener. And as I would walk to town, because black people stays on the one side, Pastor Lord will know, he's been to South Africa, white people stay on the other side, and we would have to cross the railway to go on the other side of town. And when I get to town, there'll be times when white people will throw uh, cocaines at me. White people will call me names and say things that are very, very helpful. And that builds such an anger within me towards white people. I hated white people. This anger led me to a point where myself and a few friends would go to a highway and we'd start throwing stones at cars that were driven by white people. At one point, a guy came out of his car with a gun and chased us. Again, I would not be alive today if that guy had found us. The enemy is always threatened by the destiny that's on your life. He will do everything that he can to take you out because he knows that your destiny may just be to bring transformation to the nation, to bring people to God's original design. As I grew up with this anger towards white people, and I was getting more and more involved in politics in South Africa, my parents decided to take me to a boarding school, which was a homeland in Buputatswana, where I completed my high school and I was able to go to university. But it was when I was at high school, I attended a Youth for Christ camp, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and my life was transformed. And when I went to university, at Vets University, to study engineering, while I was there, I started going to a church called His People, which was later to be Every Nation. It was a multicultural church, and it was difficult for me now fellowshipping with people that I used to hate. We did what was called racial reconciliation seminars where we started unpacking the history of South Africa and uh, we started uh, apologizing one to another about what happened in our nation. This was in 1994. And I want to fast forward to this. As I was being discipled at every nation and getting to understand the destiny that God has over my life and starting to forgive my dear brothers, white I was invited by Pastor Willem Nell, who's our pastor, pastor of Every Nation Church in Pochester, my hometown. At the time, I was already married. I was working as an engineer, working part-time for the church. And I struggled to go back to Pochester, my hometown, to go and preach the gospel to the very place where I was treated like a slave. I was struggling to go back there i said to my wife baby let me rather go by myself let me not go with you because i don't know what's going to happen driving to pochester room it's about an hour and a half drive i started sobbing along the way and crying and say god i don't know how you work you will call me to go back to the very place of pain and show me my purpose when i got there it was so strange God has a sense of humor. The church is on the same street where I worked as a gardener. The church is on the same street where I worked as a gardener. When I got there and I started preaching, I started sobbing and just saying, God wants me to forgive these people and to work with them. I want to submit to you 
That can only happen because the gospel transformed my heart. A transformed heart will transform nation. Now, reconciliation is part of my ministry because God will turn your pain into your purpose. Let us bow our heads to pray. Father, this morning as we bring this prophetic encouragement that God, you may have left some nations and some ills in society, some challenges in society to train us, to teach us warfare. Father, some of us here may be discouraged, Lord God, because we're like, where is God? Where is God? Where is God? Father, whatever pain that we may be going through, I believe that pain is meant to be our mission, our destiny to be part of transforming nations and bringing people to God's original design, to God's covenant. So, Lord, as we begin to pray this morning and intercede for the nation of Ghana and for the church, I pray that God will realize that you've placed each and every person here to transform this nation, to bring it back to God's original design. Shall we all stand? We're going to have a time of ministry now. I've asked some of the team members to pray. First, we want to pray for the nation of Ghana. We want to stand with you that God will bring transformation to this nation. And you are part of that transformation. You are part of the solution. We're going to trust God to use you to be part of the solution. We're going to also pray for the church, and we believe that God has a plan to prosper this church, to make an impact in this society. Let me ask Andrew to come and pray for the nation of Ghana and whatever impression that you have to pray. If I can hold myself together. Thank you, Pastor Simon. What, a, what an encouraging, challenging, stirring word. Shall we pray? serve a God of miracles. Father, thank you that you, for you all things are possible. You said all things are possible for those who believe. Thank you that you are a God who transforms nations. Mm. Many people said South Africa was just going to fall apart in the early 90s and you brought us through into a new South Africa. Many times we've looked like we're on the edge of the abyss, but you've been faithful and you've brought us through as we've cried out to you. Because you're a God who answers prayer and you're a God who intervenes in the affairs of men and women. And Father, we come before you with faith in our hearts for the nation of Ghana. Thank you that you that there is a prophetic identity on this nation that there is a call on this nation thank you father that there are leaders in this room thank you that the gospel has the power to transform god we pray for your blessing upon ghana can you pray with me, everyone? Can you say, God bless Ghana. God prosper Ghana. Jesus said, if two or three agree in my name on anything, it will be done. So I need to hear a little bit more enthusiasm in this. Let's pray together. God bless Ghana. God, bless Ghana. God prosper this nation. God prosper this nation. We put our faith and our trust in you. We know that you're a God who hears and who answers prayers. Visit our nation. Pour out your spirit. Prosper this nation, Lord. 
Bring transformation to this nation. Thank you that you're a God who hears. Thank you that you're a God who answers prayer. Lord, we believe you for better days ahead. Would you raise up godly leaders who will walk in your ways? Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We believe for better days that lie ahead, Father, for this nation. We thank you that the future of this nation is good. The future of this nation is blessed. The future of this nation is prosperous. We declare that over this nation, Lord. Release a river of life, I pray. Release a river of life, Lord. Where the river flows, trees grow, and those trees are for the healing of nations. That's the vision we see. Where the river of life goes, trees grow, and those trees have leaves that are for the healing of the nations. And so, Father, we release that river into Ghana. In a greater way, let the river flow. Let the trees grow. Let the trees bear fruit and let their leaves be for the healing of this nation and other nations, neighboring nations as well, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We're now going to pray for the Church of God in Ghana to play the role that God wants it to play in transforming this nation. And then after that, we're going to pray for Pastor Lord and Agnes as God has called them to play a significant role in the future of this nation. Father, we thank you for your church. We want to thank you for your body, Lord Father God. We want to thank you, Lord, that you will place your church on a hill to be a light to society, Lord Father God. That it will be a place, Lord Father God, that people can come to and feel welcome and have a sense of belonging, Lord Father God. Father, we pray that you would raise up a church to become a giant in this nation, Lord Father God. Father, we pray for a number of churches in this community, Lord Father God, that they will not be competing against one another, but be united with one another, Lord Father God. That it will become a powerful movement for your word and for your hand, Lord Father God. Father, I pray for this church specifically, Lord Father God, that people walk into this room will come to know you as their Lord and Savior. That when people walk into this room, Lord Father God, wherever this church is established, they will have a place of safety, Lord Father God. This place will be a place of belonging, Lord Father God. This will be a place, Lord Father God, where your name will be proclaimed in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.